Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to EDUSAT live lectures. Dear friends, today in introduction to proteins, we will be talking about proteins and tertiary structures. To discuss this topic, we have with us our subject expert, Dr. Unnati Gulati. Dr. Gulati is academic coordinator for sciences in consortium for Con uh, educational communications. Uh, I would like to welcome ma'am to our studios and request her to start the lecture. Thank welcome you, Amrit. Thank you, Amrit. Uh, welcome students to this lecture. We were talking about introduction to proteins and we had discussed about the primary structure. We talked about the two basic uh, secondary structures and then, then also we spoke about the turns. Now we are gradually moving to how do we get the tertiary structure. So this is the th uh, third level of hierarchy of protein structure and in this lecture we are moving from the primary to the secondary to the tertiary structure of the protein. Till now in our lectures we have learned why was the peptide bond planar and what were its implications on the protein structure. So we came to know that the, we have a Ramachandran plot in which we, we look at the angles at, uh, at the peptide bond which can be uh, permissible or not permissible and taking into account the rigidity and the planarity of the peptide bond some conformations were permissible, favorable and others were not. So, uh, we also learnt about the structure of alpha helix and beta sheets and we also talked about the amino acid preferences, certain amino acids which were favouring an alpha helix or were favouring beta sheet. We also talked about the hydrogen bonding that existed in the backbone of the uh, amino acid polypeptides. So uh, just to conclude that there is another study which is very much used when we do bioinformatics or when we are trying to see what is the propensity of amino acids as they occur into the respective secondary or tertiary structures and this was the Chow and Fassman rules which was given in around 1970s by the scientists Peter uh, by Chow and Gerald Fassman. So these are some of these are sort of a thumb rule and they talk about uh, statistical these are statistical tools obtained by computational methods. So what they have summarized is that some amino acids are going to be alpha helix formers and some are going to be breakers. Uh, remember this is also how we talked about when we discussed Ramachandran plot that amino acids have a propensity for lying in, in one of the four quadrants of the, uh, of the Ramachandran plot. So taking cue from that. So we are going to uh, just revise that glutamate, alanine and leucine are strong alpha helix formers while histidine, methionine, valine etc. are weak alpha helix formers and uh, similarly lysine and isoleucine are also weak al uh, alpha helix formers while aspartate, threonine, serine were indifferent and they can be found in both helices and sheets and asparagine and tyrosine are definitely breakers and so are prote proline and glycine which are helix breakers and we had discussed why proline and glycine are helix breakers because of their R group, R group being very small in glycine and in proline it undergoes cyclization. So what will result and what will be the sum of things that will happen once you have a polypeptide which is in its primary structure, primary, uh, primary sequence, primary sequence with all the R groups, the functional groups uh, residing in the solution. So what will be the effect eventually when we move from an open uh, polypeptide to a folded or a tertiary native structure of a protein. So there are some general things we can look at. So in this movement coming from a long chain free, uh, free uh, rope like structure to a compact globular or fibrous uh, structure we will see that some of the amino acids which are lying at the ends of the uh, polypeptide chain may come to lie closer together because of the type of interactions and we will see what type of interactions. Then there are going to be those amino acids which are going to have propensity for forming an alpha helix or a beta sheet or some uh, amino acids such as proline and glycine which are uh, definitely present in turns so their location will also determine where the protein will turn 
also some of the interacting segments uh, we will see what are interacting segments and some motifs that can be formed uh, because of the weak interactions and because of some covalent interactions uh, which which occur in the nearby uh, nearby segments of the polypeptide so what is their state so this is uh, what we are going to talk about is the tertiary structure where most of the long range aspect of the amino acid side chain will give their impact in terms of the interactions they do interactions will be covalent and non covalent so this is a three dimensional uh, placement of all those amino acids which were joined end to end in space if you can imagine that and uh, most of the interactions here also will be hydrogen bond interaction there can be uh, ionic or electrostatic interactions and there will be some covalent interactions in the form of the disulfide bonds so tertiary uh, tertiary structure of the protein generally you can say basically has two forms if you are saying a folded protein it, uh, which is having more uh, percentage of folded uh, and defined structures or more uh, percentage of defined alpha helix or beta sheets will result in either a globular or a fibrous protein so these are the two forms of a tertiary protein tertiary structure of a protein in globular you will have a compact protein structure it is very much soluble in water or even in lipid bilayers while fibrous proteins are extended protein structures which are insoluble in lipids and in water the quaternary structure in the globular protein is held together by non covalent forces while in the in the case of fibrous protein and we will look at the examples of some globular proteins and some fibrous proteins and we will see that what are the covalent changes and covalent bonds that are formed between different chains that give result to the stability of the fibrous protein the stability and the insolubility of fibrous proteins now when we talk about their stabilities different stabilities the nature of bonds the nature of interactions that result into the covalent uh, into the globular structure also results into the kind of functions a globular protein will have and similarly when we talk about more number of covalent interactions covalent or strong interactions between the chains in case of fibrous proteins then also we are talking about the kind of function it is going to serve so you will find most of your enzymes or uh, which are present which are uh, in the hormones etc which are used for transport etc um, in the cells or bones so enzymes catalysis binding all these properties are shown by globular proteins and whenever we talk about fibrous proteins then we are talking about somewhere we are uh, we are talking about structural uh, stability and strength so we will find fibrous proteins in our muscles in uh, tendons bones and ligaments and definitely hair and skin so keratin is one example collagen is one example of fibrous protein so briefly we have seen that protein will undergo some uh, hierarchical folding and it will serve some function so when we talk about fibrous protein we are looking at several chain of proteins coming together undergoing uh, undergoing uh, several interactions covalent interactions to give rise to a stable structure so the question is what is the need that a protein should not just exist at a, as a single unit why should it show assemblies so what is the need for having an assembly not just not just fibrous protein but globular protein also will show you some sort some level of assembly and when you'll come to that uh, uh, come to the example of uh, hemoglobin which is a, a standard example for a globular protein which has uh, four subunits of uh, two repeats of uh, alpha subunit and one, uh, one two repeats of beta subunits so what is the need or what is the benefit having an assembly provides so you will see that all these protein assemblies occur and because cytosol is not a dilute solution cytosol is a very dense solution having uh, all the uh, small molecules all all the carbohydrates lipids plus your polypeptides in close vicinity and such a dense solvent system 
causes the proteins to undergo folding. We will look at the details of how folding occurs, but in such a crowded environment, it is, uh, it is favorable to have a compact structure. So many of these assemblies will also have uh, in interactions, many of them will also form chaperones. If you will look at the structure of chaperones, they are not just single molecules. Some examples have large number of subunits which comprise uh, the entire architecture of a chaperone which can be functionally uh, uh, relevant. Also when assemblies occur, the energy is further decreased by reducing the surface area and also uh, many a times we can say that catalytic efficiency and cooperativity enhances when we talk about assemblies and not just single subunit. So that is the reason we will talk about quaternary structure, the need for assemblies. But looking at how important is the tertiary structure. So when we see how important is uh, anything for the tertiary structure, first important thing would be what if there is no tertiary structure. So the protein will be functional only when it is having its functional native structure and that will depend not just on its tertiary structure but will also depend on the sequence of the amino acids present in it. So when I am saying the sequence of amino acids present in it, that means I am particular about all the arrangement of amino acids and even if I replace one amino acid with uh, such an example here when I am replacing a hydrophilic amino acid glutamine with a hydrophobic amino acid valine, this is a single amino acid change and it can result into the hemoglobin molecule becoming from normal to a sickle cell type. Similarly, there are other diseases in which even one amino acid change can result into a non-functional protein. Either the protein will not reach to its site of uh, action or it may not bind to its receptor or it may not fold properly. So three things can happen if the protein primary structure is not correct. I would like to add here is that not always a replacement of just one amino acid will result into a mutation. There is some level of compensation that occurs in which if we are replacing an amino acid with a similar uh, amino acid in terms of size or R group, then many a times such mutations can be overlooked and such mutations are called silent mutations. Also, if the mutation is not lying directly in the active site or in the catalytic binding site of the protein, then also many times they can be overlooked. So this is uh, what we were talking about the quaternary structure. Looking at the first molecule is uh, insulin dimer. Insulin also undergoes uh, uh, disulfide bond formation resulting in the tertiary structure. You are seeing a hexamer of insulin and below that also is one immunoglobin. It is having several chains attached covalently. So both these examples are of proteins which undergo covalent interactions to result into quaternary structure. It is, uh, it should be reminded that quaternary structure is a level next to the tertiary structure where we are having the placement of the subunits of uh, tertiary uh, protein placed in the space and they are there for some functional reason and we will see what is that. So you will have a spontaneous assembly of subunits of polypeptides which have undergone circuit secondary structure formation, have undergone uh, tertiary structure formation and then they will result into the quaternary structure. And these inter the interactions which are important here are both covalent as well as non-covalent. So I have given example of two covalent interactions and then there are the hydrogen bonding electrostatics which will result into non-covalent interactions and will give rise to the quaternary structure. So this is the second example in which uh, we are seeing how hemoglobin which is uh, the quaternary structure is formed from the subunits uh, alpha and beta chains which are present in dimers. So you have a quaternary structure and these are held by only 
hydrogen bonding. So, in quaternary structure also we can classify them if we have many number of subunits present which are joint with non covalent and only hydrogen bonding uh, uh, electrostatic interactions then we are going to call them as oligomers or subunits. You can have a multimeric protein if there are a large number of subunits present in it. You can have repeat repeats of the same type of subunit which we saw in the case of insulin or you can have heterotypic in which the interactions are occurring between different type of subunits as you are looking at hemoglobin. So, uh, we can call them as chains, the subunits are called as chains if they are bound by covalent interactions and otherwise we can call them as subunits if they are interacting with only non covalent interactions. You will get to know more about these uh, non covalent interactions when we discuss them in detail. Also when I am talking about three, three dimensional placement of the subunits some characteristic uh, structures emerge and some types of symmetries have been uh, discussed about them. So, we can have two fold symmetry imagine uh, if we are looking at a globular subunit and it is placed in different uh, orientations. So, you can have a two dimensional three fold or a four fold type of symmetry of these subunits. Also, we can have dihedral symmetry and we also have icosahedral symmetry which is very much seen in the viruses, capsid proteins. So, uh, below this there are some of the examples of cyclic, dihedral, tetrahedral, octahedral and icosahedral type of symmetries and these structures you will find across many proteins. Here we are looking at helical uh, subunits and this results in open ended tubular kind of structures. So, these are open ended helical subunits in uh, spiral. Another aspect of assembly is that there are some supramolecular structures that are formed only when we need them to carry out some metabolic function or to carry out some important uh, function when we are doing either DNA replication or protein translation or RNA uh, regulation. So, what is happening there? Several proteins come together and they form a large complex. So, PIC is one complex and we are looking here transcription pre-initiation complex is also shown here. So, these are an assembly of several proteins that come together to form an entire machinery that will carry out the function of regulation or of uh, DNA uh, replication. So, these are multimeric protein assemblies having several subunits of different types and they can be found in very specific uh, processes. So, we are looking when we do all this so we are looking at that there are present not just one type of uh, assembly we are looking at tertiary and then there are also uh, quaternary and even in quaternary we have a variety of protein structures. So, scientists have tried to find what are the structures that are present and these have been compiled in the protein data bank. So, you have the X-ray and the NMR structures. So, when we have so many structures we have to set down some, uh, some key rules or some key aspects upon which we can classify them. So, we can classify them on the basis of their structure, on the function and, and how they have evolved. So, we will look at the basic unit of a super secondary structure which is the motif. A motif, a motif is a super secondary structure, it is a transition, we are not directly going from a secondary alpha beta present in a polypeptide chain directly to a tertiary structure. Many a times these alpha chains beta sheets are arranged in certain patterns, specific combinations which can be easily recognized. So, such as uh, beta alpha beta loop and these motifs are evolutionarily conserved and they have a defined conformation. So, you can recognize these motifs when you look at a larger protein you can say ok you can see a beta alpha beta, uh, beta kind of a, a repeated unit. So, they usually have a consensus primary sequence remember some amino acids will tend to have 
propensity for alpha and beta. So, they will tend to occur more frequently in these secondary structures. So, a motif can occur in a number of proteins where it carries out similar or uh, same functions and motif is a subset of fold and it is an architectural or topological unit. So, these are some of the motifs just uh, we can go through them. We have helix loop, helix, coil coils and even in betas we have certain combinations and there we are trying to see the Greek key motif as which is observed in the uh, Greek building design and then we have uh, barrels and beta twisted betas and combination of alpha helices and beta structures. Then we have beta hairpins, Greek keys, meandering loops, zinc fingers. Zinc fingers are DNA binding domains. So, wherever you will find a DNA binding domain in a protein, you can look for a zinc finger kind of motif. So, there are certain uh, cation binding units uh, and some anion binding units which can be uh, searched when you are looking at a protein with specific function. So, you may find these kind of motifs being present there. Another way of classifying uh, the proteins across so many number of proteins present in the protein data bank, we can have a class of protein, a protein which is having all uh, which is having uh, secondary structure arrangements and in which different folds have been grouped into major four classes and then there is a fifth class. So, you have all alpha helical, all beta, all. So, this is an example of all alpha helical proteins uh, in the database. You can see these examples. There is no other uh, beta or beta in this protein, but all comprised of alpha. Similarly, this, these proteins are comprised only of beta and then they are proteins which are combination of uh, alpha and beta present one after the other and then there can be alpha and beta present which are uh, one of them is present and uh, they may be sub, uh, supplemented with the other, but they are not present as uh, we were seeing here, not present one after the other, but a combination of the two. So, the important thing is, is the structure and function linked? When we are looking at, we can easily say that this protein is containing all alpha. Can we say that it all the alpha pro, uh, containing proteins are going to have one function? So, it is not always and that is why some proteins of similar domain structure may have different functions as we can see here in the first three examples. And here we are seeing similar functions, but see the structure is so disparate. You are seeing so much of uh, beta sheet and dispersed alpha helices and here this function is so disparate. Here the same type of domain, but the function is different. So, the databases that have been compiled by comparison of these 3D structures in the PDP and all the results are exhaustively and they are studied pairwise and structural comparison is done either through computational or through manual means and we are able to report all the folds that are present, all the domains that are present and we can find form a classification of proteins. So, there are three major databases that are prevalent, all three of them take help uh, are based on the uh, protein data bank. We have structural classification of proteins, uh, class, architecture, topology, homology, superfamily which is CAT and FSSP, FSSP which is plural classification based on structure structure alignment of protein. So, there are components of the tertiary structure which are domain and motif. So, motif we have discussed which is a structural or topological unit and it is a very recognizable fold. While domain is a compact self folding component of protein that represents a usually a discrete structural and functional unit. Domains are uh, product of only one exon and domains can be formed from different number of uh, different folds. They can be comp comprised of only one fold, there are simple folds or they can be comprised of 
complex folds. So this is what we are trying to show that a uh, motif which is beta alpha beta is present in the domain and we are looking at the domain is the alpha beta type barrel. So how it is nested in it. So domains are the functional units and they are independently folded and they arise from separate exons and domains are also responsible for the uh, catalytic or binding or transmembrane properties of the protein. Domains are functional as well as uh, encoded by separate exons. So when we are looking at a gene, a domain will be formed from only one exon product. So uh, this is how we do the scope uh, structural classification of protein database. In this, if we are trying to uh, see this diagram, we have the four levels. So all the structural which is uh, classes and motifs are going to be studied. In the functional we will study the domain and if we are talking about families then we are looking at their evolutionary connect. So all proteins in the first in the PDB are going to be first uh, split into their constituent domains. So the domains which will show similarity greater than 30 percent will result in uh, will be attached to some family. The families are going to further uh, be part of the super family which is group which groups the domain for which there is structural as well as functional similarity and we can say that it is evident that they might have emerged from common ancestor. So the highest uh, level of this classification is the fold which talks about all the domains as well as other secondary structures of the protein. So we are looking at the three components of evolutionary hierarchy here and as we have discussed in the uh, flow diagram before. So this is what the scopus is going to scope is going to talk about it is a manual hierarchical classification and it provides detailed evolutionary information. Similarly, we have CAT which is going to have manual as well as automated uh, classification. It is based on the uh, class, architecture, topology and homology. So this is also talking about evolutionary as well as structural. And the third one we talked about, it is totally automated and it is also a type of hierarchical uh, classification. On the right hand side you can see that all of them are arranged in terms of trees. So we can create evolutionary trees when we do uh, these kind of classifications. So till now we have talked about the classification of uh, proteins in terms of how folds, domains and motifs can be uh, and superfamilies can talk about their structure, function as well as their uh, ancestral. Uh, relationship between one, uh, all of them. So this diagram will summarize, uh, this diagram summarize that how we can actually study the protein, uh, protein evolution and you can see how evolution of a globin like protein is shown in this uh, diagram. So from the basic uh, plant uh, globin which is uh, oxygen binding uh, protein here leg hemoglobin. So how one branch has come to leg hemoglobin hemoglobin and similarly it has branched to myoglobin and hemoglobin. So, so this is what we can do using these databases and carry and we can study their uh, evolution and evolutionary relationships and find functions for new proteins uh, if we have found a new protein and try to get the uh, X-ray or NMR structure for it. <laughs>
Uh, students, in this section, we are going to talk about the interactions that stabilize the tertiary structure. Uh, so, the objectives of this lecture would be what is the role of amino acids in the primary and the primary sequence in the tertiary protein structure? What are the key interactions that stabilize the protein structures? And how do protein subunits interact at the quaternary level of protein structure? So, till now we have understood that there are some propensities for structures and there are certain principles on which a tertiary structure will be formed. We were talking about how cytosol is a crowded environment and that will result in the molecules to undergo a compact structure. So, some of the key design principles which you will see are important for protein folding and having an, a tertiary structure, having a defined tertiary structure, uh, what are these? So, we will look at them. So, we will have uh, R groups which are very important chemical entity which will direct how protein will fold, what kind of interactions will occur. Then we have to attain compactness, enthalpy and entropy and kinetics. When we are going to talk about protein folding per se, we will talk about it as a process which is kinetically as well as thermodynamically justifiable. So, we will look at those things once we do folding. So, what are the design principles for protein? Once the secondary structure has been formed and only alpha helices and beta sheets are generally found in different structural layers. You will not find alpha helix and beta sheet existing in the same layer. The reason being that first of all alpha helix is hydrogen bonded within uh, at its backbone within itself and it can only hydrogen bond with another alpha helix and similarly for a beta sheet and when both are going to come together they cannot hydrogen bond and hence it will become an unstable structure. Then segments which were adjacent to each other in the amino acid sequence usually will come close together. So, this coming close together is facilitated by the turns and many a times the distant segments of the polypeptide may come together in the tertiary structure. Also there are some rules in which there is never going to be a knotting of the polypeptide chain. It is very common to uh, uh, imagine that a long chain of polypeptide having all these amino acids can undergo folding and can knot itself. But usually protein structures never have such knots and most of the times they will have a right handed crossover because it is uh, favored in terms of how it uh, turns through small angles and it is uh, tends to uh, have easier connections compared to the left handed connections which must traverse very sharp angles and very hard to form. So, you will encounter mostly right handed beta strand connections. Also beta strand connections are more stable when they are having slight right twist and as you can see in the diagram above and in the diagram below also you are having a beta barrel with a twisted beta sheet that forms core of many of these beta uh, barrel proteins either they are going to be part of the transport proteins. So, secondary structures also tend to interact with each other in three dimension. If adjacent in the primary sequence they will tendency uh, they will have tendency to form super secondary structures which we were talking about as the motifs and uh, the unique property of polypeptide chains significantly decreases the number of polypep possible three dimensional arrangements and as we were con we were uh, saying we were talking about the planarity of the peptide bond and the rigidity around the phi shy angles. So, even in unrelated proteins these structural motifs tend to fold in the same manner and thing to note here is that maybe you will not have the exact sequence, but it may result in the exact motif and many a time they have different function, but the, in the motif may look exactly the same. And uh, modular structure of proteins, when we were talking about domains, a domain gives us an idea that a protein can be broken down into small functional units and 
when we take this uh, idea to how it was expressed and transcribed and then translated from the gene, we know that only the exons are going to code for the polypeptide sequence. Before they can be uh, spliced and stuck together, each exon is responsible for a domain. So, we can have domain shuffling that can result from gene shuffling. This kind of parallel transfer can occur uh, even at evolutionary levels. We can see that new proteins can be formed in which domains could have just uh, been introduced from other organisms. So, proteins have a modular structure. This gives them uh, the independence to fold and function proper properly. And many a times uh, these domains which are typically or DNA binding and ATPS domains will occur as the same uh, structure and motif, but across different protein families. So, we were talking about how we can trace the evolution of proteins through studying the protein structure. We can look at the families they belong to. Then we can talk about how they are homologous, paralogous or orthologous. We can look at certain characteristic functions and sequences and motifs. So, we can have uh, FAD, NAD binding, we have ATPase activity, kinase activity, cytochrome B5 like domains. And if we look at those domains and try to chart them through across all other organisms, we can find the similarity in sequence and in structure and can create a tree uh, relating or showing point of divergence of among two organisms or two proteins. So, now we will uh, talk about what is the bearing of the polypeptide chain by virtue of its planar peptide bonds. The planar peptide bonds result in the, uh, the polypeptide chain to be highly rigid and there are only two degrees of freedom which are going to be present in the polypeptide chain. It is going to be either at the phi or at the shy angles. Some angles are more favorable and uh, some angles such as uh, phi or shy equal to 0 and 180 is unfavorable. So, you will see in this quadrant only this quadrant, a uh, first quadrant and the third quadrant are more favored while others are least favored and this one is not at all inhibited. Uh, is inhabited. So, we can say that there are some constraints on the phi and shy by virtue of the planarity. Why virtue of the planarity? This diagram explains you what causes this rigidity or what causes the favorable, uh, favorable angles. Here we are looking at the non uh, looking at the oxygen atoms between the two planes and as we try to rotate the phi and the shy angles, there are points at which these are going to overlap. And we know if we take these atoms to be as hard balls, they are not going to overlap ever. And the, all those angles which will result or which will uh, have an overlap will not be favorable. This is called the steric hindrance. So, only those conformations will be favored where there is no overlap. Another property we should remind uh, ourselves now is that we had studied the 20 standard amino acids and we had uh, grouped them into 5 groups basis on, based on their polar, nonpolar, being um, uncharged, being positively charged or negatively charged. So, uh, a quick reminder of uh, those amino acids because these properties will be important when we talk about the interactions. So, when we are going from the primary sequence to the tertiary structure, it will be wise to remember that uh, secondary structure was very was uh, uh, entirely dependent on hydrogen bond formation. The helices and the sheets were often closely packed. The peptide segments between secondary structures tend to be short and direct. Proteins fold so as to give the most stable conformation conformation and the stability comes from formation of first large number of 
intramolecular hydrogen bonds as present in the secondary structure. Remember the alpha helices and the sheets having the backbone um, hydrogen bonding. Then reduction in the surface area because we were talking about proteins folding in the very, uh, very crowded cytosol. Then proteins are typically mixture of hydrophilic and hydrophobic uh, amino acids and there will be the chemical interaction of these uh, R groups that will favor some sort, some types of interactions and not favor other interactions and we will see them in details. So, when we are looking at globular protein which we said was the soluble protein having mostly non-covalent interactions. So, in this helices and sheets make up the core of the globular protein. Most of the polar residues are going to be on the outside and these polar residues will form hydrogen bonding with the water or solvent we are saying. Hydrophobic residues will rise, will always be in the core and we will see why hydrophobic residues will always be in the core. Packing of the residue is very close. Uh, if we look at how packing occurs in the protein structure and you might have many times seen the uh, stick and ball diagram of uh, protein you will find it is a very compact molecule in which all the atoms are present quite adjacent to each other. Uh, I would say that it is almost like a solid in which atoms are present very close together. So, there are although uh, van der Waals volume that we account to all the atoms will result into a compact structure, but several times you will also encounter some voids or some binding sites where the atoms may not be very closely present. These are also functionally very important uh, uh, spaces. Also there is going to be a tendency to have maximum number of intra uh, molecular hydrogen bonding and we will see how all these principles will apply to protein folding into uh, from the primary to the tertiary structure. So, here is a quick look at uh, what we talked about uh, tertiary structure having beta sheets, alpha helices or turns present in it and the most important interaction here was the hydrogen bonding. So, you can see a hydrogen bonding in which there is uh, partial charges developed at the hydrogen and oxygen because of the electronegativity of the oxygen, the lone pair of electrons, it is attracting the hydrogen. So, the hydrogen bond is formed and here the hydrogen bonds were formed between the backbone, carbonyl and the NH groups. So, to summarize the interactions that are going to be present in the, pro in the tertiary structure, we talked about there are going to be some non-covalent interactions non-covalent interactions are non-bond interactions. First, we will have the electrostatic interactions. These are the long range interactions and all those amino acids which will have a pKa resulting into the ionization of their R group will show this kind of electrostatic interaction. So, think about those amino acids which were basic or acidic having a negative or a positive charge. When we talk about electrostatic interactions in the core of the protein, we call it as the salt bridge. And then we will talk about van der Waals interactions which will result into London dispersion forces and these are weak type of electrostatic interactions. These are given by those amino acids which are having a very large bulky R group. This uh, bulky R group is non-polar. Then we have hydrophobic effect given by those amino acids which do not have uh, which have either aromatic or non-polar uh, side chain. These kind of residues do not uh, interact with each other neither they repel uh, each other nor they form strong interactions, but they are hydrophobic that is they will repel water and they are self loving, but water hating. These uh, hydrophobic uh, our, um, amino acids are all your long chain uh, arom and your aromatic amino acids. Then you have in uh, hydrogen bonding uh, which will occur between uh, NH and CO groups and hydrogen bonding as you have studied with the 
secondary structure was important forces. So, just summarizing in this diagram, we are looking at the electrostatic which is present in the NH3 plus and the carbonyl ca oxygen here which is a salt bridge. Then we have uh, OH, OH hydrogen bond present here. Then we have uh, hydrophobic interactions where you are seeing the aromatic chains, aromatic groups have come close together and they have shielded themselves from the aqueous environment or any other charged amino acid. Then there is disulfide bonds which are the covalent forces and you have several hydrogen bondings which are going to be present in, uh, in this uh, molecule. Then surface amino acids are going to have uh, hydrogen bonding with the water or, or solvent present, present on the surface. So, these are the key interactions. First, let us look at what is electrostatic interactions. We all know when we talk of, talk of electrostatic interactions, we are talking of definite negative and positive charges that are going to give rise to an ionic bond. These will require one positive and one negative. So, opposite charges are going to be present there. When we talk about electrostatic interactions in terms of proteins, we call them as salt bridges. Electrostatic interactions are going to be uh, high uh, enthalpy, I will discuss enthalpy with you and uh, am amino acids such as aspartic acid or glutamic acids, think about all the other uh, amino acids having R group with these, uh, these R groups. So, they will once they undergo uh, uh, ionization depending on the pKa around them, they will result in ionic bond formation. Also uh, ionic bonds that are formed have different strength. If they are present in aqueous environment, they may have less strength because there is a tendency of these electrostatic uh, uh, of these ionic charges to have bonding with water. Water is also an ionic uh, uh, molecule. So, these will have tendency to form bonds with the water, but when these uh, when these uh, ionic residues are present inside or when they are buried in the hydrophobic core, they tend to be much stronger electrostatic bonds. They tend to be about 20 times more, uh, uh, more strong bonds as compared to electrostatic bonds formed in the water. So, then uh, we are looking at how salt bridges are formed. Uh, Another example of electrostatic interactions will be your London forces or Van der Waal interactions, but those are weak interactions and we will discuss about them. So, what is London dispersion forces? First, we will see that all those amino acids which are having large hydrocarbon R groups are going to show this kind of interaction. But when I am saying this and I am looking at the structure of these amino acids, I am not seeing any group which is showing me either cationic or anionic behavior. So, where does the charge come from and when I am saying that it is an inter electro, uh, electrostatic interaction. So, all these uh, amino acids which are having long chain hydrocarbons are showing nonpolar behavior and we know nonpolar amino acids tend to get buried or tend to come to the core and they try to repel water. Once they do that, they will normally not show any kind of repulsion amongst them, but when they are going to come very close together because of this burying, they will be an in induced dipole form in one of the uh, molecules and this induced dipole will cause the other molecule to have an another induced dipole. So, there is an one instantaneous dipole formed. Uh, if you can see the example here in this diagram, we are having two uh, R groups. If the balls are two R groups, we bring them further closer together, they will cause distortion of the electronic cloud. This distortion of electronic cloud will cause some dipole like, inter, uh, like uh, charge distribution occurring here. So, you had a neutral molecule, but because of the distortion, there is a partial negative and positive charge formed. This distorted instantaneous dipole will induce dipole in the nearby uh, similar 
hydrocarbon molecule and now both of them have become partially charged and this again is the basis of forming of an electrostatic bond similar to what you saw before although that bond was very strong these are very weak. Although they are very weak and we say that there is, uh, re, there is formation of London dispersion forces resulting into the Van der Waals effect. So, first distinguish what is London dispersion forces and how they are created and this whole uh, uh, phenomena is called the Van der Waals effect. And although they are of very low energy, but many such, uh, many such uh, Van der Waals uh, interactions will sum up to give large contribution to the stability of the protein. So, uh, Van der Waals interactions are resulting from the, uh, uh, from the aromatic non-polar amino acids itself. Then we have uh, these two interactions were your non-covalent ionic interactions. We are looking at salt uh, at uh, disulfide bonds which are covalent interactions and which are found in your tertiary as well as quaternary structure. So, cysteine is the uh, amino acid which is which when in presence of oxygen will form a dimer and release of peroxide will occur. So, you have the side chain uh, CH to SH and present at very different locations in the polypeptide they might come closer and oxygen uh, will cause here oxidation will occur hydrogen will be removed and you have a disulfide bridge form. It is a covalent interaction and it is a very strong bond. This may be formed within the same chain or it may also be formed in two different chains. So, we have talked about all those interactions that are uh, that are electrostatic and all the electrostatic interactions will contribute to the enthalpy of the protein folding. Another electrostatic interaction we can talk about is the hydrogen bond. As I said water is also an ionic molecule because there is a charge distribution across the hydrogen and the oxygen, oxygen being highly electronegative. So, there is partial charge distribution there, even hydrogen bond is one type of electrostatic interaction. Hydrogen bonds we have seen are very important in the secondary structure, they are also important when you are looking at the other two levels of uh, interaction of, uh, of uh, structure. So, we are looking in the diagram 1 we have a donor and an acceptor molecule wherever there is a hydrogen bond donor and acceptor you can think about a hydrogen bond being formed this is this what in the diagram below this is what you saw in the secondary structure so the backbone carbonyls and the nitrogen was able to form a hydrogen bond similarly a hydrogen bond can form within water molecules. So, you have uh, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, there is negative charge over oxygen and positive charge over hydrogen. So, this electrostatic uh, interaction or dipolar interaction will result, will result into hydrogen bonds. So, water can also show hydrogen bonding, your R groups of amino acids can show hydrogen bonding and the backbone of the polypeptide can show hydrogen bonding. So, there are different levels of hydrogen bonding and we will see how all of them will contribute to the protein structure. So, uh, so we have studied till now about those interactions which are electrostatic and they impart stability to the tertiary structure. We have also seen what is the role of the polypeptide backbone and planarity of the polypeptide bond that results into some conformations being favorable and some unfavorable. We also talked about how we had grouped the amino acids on the basis of the chemical nature of their R group and we had seen how it was the nature of the R group that gave them nature as well as uh, size of the R group that gave them the tendency to either be in a beta sheet or in the alpha helix and we talked about the Chow-Fassman rule which was uh, based on their propensities. 
So, with this we have uh, come to understand the important forces which are other which are because of the R groups present in the amino acids. So, we can say most of the tertiary structure is based on the primary structure. Uh, in spite of when we talk about that in motifs many a times you will see that the sequences may not match, but replacement can be with similar amino acids which will result in similar motifs and fo uh, motifs of structures. So, uh, we will stop here now and uh, discuss further uh, pr uh, folding and other interactions of tertiary structures. On that note, I would like to thank ma'am for this very enriching discussion and I would like to thank you dear friends for watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you.